All right, check this out. I posted this photo on my Instagram feed. Obviously here I am welding stainless steel, but check out the comment that I got. Now, so many photos that I post on my Instagram, probably one of the most common comments that I get are people asking for my settings. At least it's not somebody telling me that I suck. But as far as my settings goes, this is actually something I can't really respond to anybody with that will actually help them out. And here is why. Every machine, every joint configuration, every welding position that you do, what settings might have worked absolutely perfect for me welding this thing here might not work at all for somebody welding something else. So let's go over some really important things that you can do to get yourself set up properly and get some great welding done. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna go over here is the subject of amperage. Roughly put, amperage is essentially the amount of heat that we are using to weld our workpiece. Now, like I said, trying to communicate what's gonna work perfect as far as amperage is gonna be a little bit tough to do, simply because, like I said, something that worked great for an outside corner and got me really good results, like something like this here, these settings might work completely different if you're doing something like a 90 degree fillet joint. Maybe welding some pipe or some exhaust or something like that. We can essentially use the exact same settings for everything, but with each project, we are going to get drastically different results. So we are gonna to need to figure out what works best for the job that you are doing. Take a quick look at this reference chart here. This is essentially a basic recommendations for settings for stainless steel TIG welding. This should give you a rough ballpark of where you can start from as far as finding how much amperage you actually need. And while I do use this as a reference sometimes and send it to people who need help getting set up, honestly, there's too many variables that can change the way that these settings perform with many different joints. For example, what position are you welding in? What size filler material are you using? These are all essentially things that can change up the variables to make settings like this weld not so great. So let's go over what I do with my students in my online TIG welding program to get them set up properly. Basically, if you have a foot pedal or a thumb trigger with a slider or something like that, Basically, anything that lets you control the amount of amperage that you are using as you are welding. Essentially, I kind of say it like this. You're all good. Essentially, you will have the freedom to set your amperage to something that you know will be more than enough. And then as you are welding, you can use a foot pedal or something like that to dictate how much of this amperage or heat you are using. Obviously, as long as you are paying really close attention to make sure that things are not getting too hot, you can generally make adjustments on the fly to control the amount of heat input as you see fit as you are welding. Now, when I say that you can set your amperage a little bit too high, let's not get too crazy here. I'm talking about 10, maybe 15 amps, 20 at the absolute most. If you are ever in doubt with how much amperage to use, shooting a little bit high and then paying absolutely super close attention to the amount of heat that you are using as you are welding, this is a great approach to make sure that you don't sell yourself short with the amount of amperage that you are using, because obviously this would cause you to have inadequate heat input. When you're welding with a little bit more amperage than you actually know that you need, you can make adjustments with your foot pedal or your slider on the fly. The one thing that we need to make sure that we avoid is edges that look like this here. You can see how the filler material is not transitioning smoothly into the base material at all. This indicates that the amperage you are using or the overall heat input is too low. Obviously, inadequate fusion is something we really wanna make sure that we avoid. This is what you're looking for right here. You can see how the edges are blending in so much more smoothly and consistently. This indicates that the amount of heat input is pretty much perfect in relation to the thickness of material you are using. Obviously, when we see stuff like this here, this is gonna indicate that we are using excessive heat input. Dial that sucker back. When you start to see a nice balance and a nice transition between the filler material and the base material, you know that you are starting to get on the right track. Also, the nice thing about stainless steel is you have the freedom to look at your heat affected zone. Compared to the welding pass itself, it should be relatively consistent and somewhat narrow. We do not want to see a heat affected zone looking crazy or excessive like this here. So again, when we have the value of our amperage set correctly, or you are actually controlling the perfect amount of amperage with your foot pedal or something like that. You're gonna see smooth looking edges like this stuff here and a controlled heat affected zone. Okay, so deciding on the perfect amount of amperage to use is very important. But this next setting is severely underrated when welding with stainless steel. This is something that I go over all the time in my online TIG welding program and this is the subject of post flow. If you don't know, post flow is the gas that is going to run out of your torch for a certain amount of time after you finish a weld. On most machines, this is typically measured in seconds. And like I said, especially with stainless steel is something that you should pay very close attention to. 
Now, when we finish a weld with stainless steel, obviously that we can see the welding area is glowing red hot. Pretty cool, right? Now, when the material is glowing like this, it is at a temperature where it is now at risk from being oxidized by exposure to our atmosphere. And if this happens, oxide like this is going to form. That's what all this gray stuff is, it's oxide. Oxide can form on the welding area like you're looking at here. It can also form on the filler material. And in some cases, it can even form on the tungsten electrode itself. Take a look at this example here. We can see that very little to no oxide is present. That's why the welding area looks gold like this. Now, in order to prevent any oxide from forming on the welding area, we need to make sure it is properly shielded by gas. Now, pretty much everything that I'm doing in this shop here, I'm using 100% argon gas. We are gonna use this to completely cover the welding area as well as the filler material itself. And we're gonna keep the area completely covered by gas until everything has returned to a state where we can safely remove it from the welding area. Anytime you look at the welding area and you see that things are looking excessively gray or dull in the finish, or if we take a look at the filler material, we see oxide on that. It's gonna be really tough to pick up from a weld like this and continue on without having to deal with contamination. Or if you have oxide that is formed on the tip of the filler material, when you use this for the next puddle that you do after this one, when you introduce this filler material to the welding area, it is going to contaminate it. Typically, the rule of thumb that I go with on this is that when you finish a weld, you will see the welding area glowing red hot. We wanna make sure that we keep this area completely covered with gas while it is glowing red hot. The post flow is gonna cycle while this is cooling down, and then you wanna have it run a couple extra seconds after everything has finished glowing. We also wanna make sure that we keep the filler material in the gas envelope for a couple seconds as well. When we finish the weld, we wanna stay in extremely close to the workpiece. Do not move at all. We wanna make sure that we keep the filler material in the gas envelope for at least a couple seconds as well and we wanna remain completely stationary until the cycle has finished running. A lot of people will set their machine up with the perfect amount of post flow, but when they complete and finish a welding pass, they remove the filler material from the welding area like this right away here. And you can see the oxide that forms on these filler materials pretty easily. Exact same thing with the welding torch. When you finish, you may have the perfect amount of post flow set on your machine, but if you remove it from the welding area before this post flow cycle has finished running, everything oxidizes immediately. Do not move. Like I said, I generally recommend to set this value of time a couple extra seconds than you know you actually end up needing. If the welding area has heated up more, you know you're gonna need more time of post flow set on your machine. Now, if we're doing something like low amperage welding where there's less heat into the workpiece, obviously the welding area is gonna be cooling down a lot quicker so you can save yourself some gas and dial the timer down quite a bit on this one. Take the time to properly set this up for whatever you are doing. This is just a way that you can make sure you have adequate gas running to prevent any oxide from forming. And when this is done correctly, your stuff is gonna look nice and shiny and you can show it off to all your friends and brag. <laughs> Okay, so now that we have talked about post flow and how to properly shield the welding area with the gas that it needs, the next thing we need to talk about is exactly how much gas you should be using. In my personal opinion, the factor that dictates the amount of gas that I'm going to be using is going to be the cup size. For example, if you are welding using 305 CFH, 305 CFH, that's supposed to be 35 CFH. If you're using 35 CFH coming out through a number 15 size cup, this is gonna run really nicely, especially through a screen like this. It's gonna come out nice and smooth. But what if somebody hears that you're using 35 CFH and then tries to run it coming out of a number eight cup? Sure, you may have good gas coverage coming out of this number eight cup, but the control of your arc is going to weld like shit. <laughs> you will notice, especially with stainless steel, that when you are welding with excessive gas flow, your puddle is going to be wobbling around and not stable at all. Excessive gas flow is gonna cause the edges of your puddle to be pushed out this way and that. It is really tough to get your puddle to sit down and weld smoothly when you have too much gas running out of your torch in relation to the cup size that you are using. Like I said, a number 15 size cup is going to evenly distribute a bigger volume of gas to the welding area. And looking at the screens like these ones here in my edge welding cups, these are gonna to help to keep the gas flow really consistent and really smooth. However, like I said, if we take something like a diffuser type setup and we run the same volume of gas through like a number eight cup or something like this, it's gonna weld completely different. Now you can see from this chart here, this is something that is included in my program that you can register for. This is gonna give you a rough outline for exactly how much gas to run in relation to the cup that you are using. This is gonna to help to keep the welding area shielded properly. 
However, the gas volume that's coming through your torch is gonna fit really nice with the cup size that you are using. However, keep the welding area stable and prevent excessive wobbling. Yes, wobbling is a welding term, I just made it up. So similar to the setting of amperage as well as the setting of post flow, the actual volume or amount of gas that you are using is going to be subjective to the setup that you are using as well as the job or joint that you might be welding. If you are welding something that requires more amperage, the welding area is going to be hotter and it is going to be greater. You will need to shield that entire area with gas properly. If you need more gas for a larger welding area, I recommend using a larger cup. Obviously with a larger cup, you're gonna need a higher gas setting. If you're doing a welding area that's very narrow and requires less heat input, I recommend using a smaller cup and you can then dial your gas volume back a little bit. Think about the size of the welding area that you want to cover. You now have a general idea of what size of cup to select and then you adjust your gas level accordingly. Keep that sucker properly covered while the welding area is spicy. Keep your torch in nice and close. Do not move it until everything has finished cooling down. And then once everything looks good, you can remove your torch and you are good to go. You can register for my online stainless steel TIG welding class right now. It's free. It's a 45 minute workshop that I teach in person, but now it's packaged together in a private website online that you can register for and go watch it for free. Go jump in that class right now. You're going to have a blast. Do random act of kindness for a stranger today. My name is Dusty James. Phil and chill. We will talk soon. Peace.